So greetings, greetings, greetings. Welcome our brilliant colleague, Stefan. We so appreciate your remarkable leadership and consistent solidarity. And as always, it's set C. Begin all things by giving thanks to our creator, by giving thanks to the original stewards of the various lands we're on. We give thanks to all our ancestors, all those who toiled without compassion or compensation. We give thanks to all our elders and community stalwarts whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. So Stefan, can you please share a bit about your remarkable work with our listeners and our viewers? Yes, thank you, Victor. Thank you so much for having me here. It's such an honor to be in this great group of uh, people who do this, such fantastic and so important work. My name is Stefan Junkert. Uh, I work for the International Institute for Sustainable Development, which uh, could be described as sort of an, an, a global sustainable solutions think tank. Uh, so a lot of our work is international. We work a lot with governments uh, all around the world. But I actually have the pleasure of working with a small group that focuses on community well-being. Uh, in Canada and in, in some other countries as well. And uh, what we're doing uh, mainly is we, we help communities to uh, um, determine really what matters to them for their well-being. But then really we're focusing on um, accessing data, finding data that can describe those uh, those objectives uh, and to develop indicators on things that matter to them. So we're really looking for a way of using data in a way that resonates with people. Um, and then once we have found that data to make it accessible through simple online data dashboards. Now, we started that work in, in Winnipeg in a fantastic partnership with the United Way Winnipeg, which uh, came to us over, over a decade ago and, and asked us uh, to help them you know, measure the impacts of their work. Um, but we're now also working with the Community Foundations of Canada. We're supporting the Vital Science Program uh, in that respect. And we were just working with many fantastic partners uh, in Canada and also internationally. Uh, one of our flagship uh, projects internationally that we're involved in is, is what's called the Leave No One Behind Partnership, uh, which focuses on helping marginalized communities in a set of countries to gather their own data so that they can make their voices heard and count in decision making. So it's really collecting data for advocacy to really get them sort of uh, get their situation more more uh, raise awareness about their situation uh, and what, what is necessary to help them. Now, we're doing all this in the context of the 2030 the agenda and the, the sustainable development goals. And it's uh, I would say it's, it's important to say the 2030 agenda first, because this is where the leave no one behind promise is, right? This is uh, we're doing all this without leaving anybody behind. And we're promising to focus on the needs of those most behind first. That second half of the sentence sometimes gets forgotten, but it's really the indication that we really need to solve inclusion for all of the SDGs, right? It's going to be very hard to make progress on any SDGs if we're not taking this uh, this promise of leaving no one behind seriously. Um, but the uh, the other thing that we found also is that by connecting the SDG, the by connecting local action to the SDGs, we we actually can instill a sense of validation to what community work is all about because it really gives that feeling that uh, yeah you you're, you're taking care of your community, but at the same time you're making progress on this set of uh, globally shared goals. So it provides this external ver uh, validation of the of the work and and creates a sense of commonality and community across your your local setting. That's incredible. Congrats on such phenomenal work. My father always told me to think globally and act locally. And I think the intersectional approach to your data collection and dissemination, even the stewardship and governance is truly remarkable. And in a time when data is more important than other to inform public policy and asset and resource allocation, really, really inspired by your work. So thank you, sir, for all that you and your colleagues are doing for so many. So my next question is what's inspiring you right now? What has you curious or what's keeping you up at night? Yeah. What, what, I have to say what in general what inspires me most is really bringing data together with stories about lived experience. And um, I, I guess this may be a shared sentiment, but often when I look at data, I'm, I'm mostly intimidated, right? They, you always get the feeling that data can tell you about problems, about challenges, about things that are not the way they should be, but it's very hard to use data to actually find solutions. And, and very often, if we try to do that, we, we're risking getting things wrong. Like there, there's so many ways of interpreting data in a way that's not appropriate for individual settings. Now, when you take stories, stories are amazing to find out what can be done. And uh, the personal account is incredibly important to understand how we can make progress. But a story alone sometimes leaves you with a similar feeling that you say, well, you know, it's great that that exists in the setting, but my setting is different. How, how do I learn from, from this story? And when we bring the two together, we can we can at least uh, yeah, instill that feeling that you're not alone, right? You're, 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 you have a story and that story is specific to one community, to one group of people, to one person maybe. But you can confidently say this is not the only story. Like we we actually have 
settings that resemble themselves, even though they are very different. So I can in, can sort of instill that confidence that we're um, we're able to make progress, and we are we can collectively um, uh, make a, a move on some of move the needle on some of those indicators that we're looking at. Incredible. So perfect segue. What are some of the challenges and barriers you and your colleagues are facing, and what are some of the approaches you're taking to overcome some of these challenges and barriers? Yeah, so so one of the challenges that we've learned over time is, and this this is really in the context when we we moved from sort of our our partnership in Winnipeg, where we've been working together for a very long time, trying to bring that experience to other communities, is that it's one thing to access data and build a shiny data dashboard, uh, but it's another thing to actually use it so in a way that it's useful, that it has a real impact, and to keep it going in the long run. Unfortunately, data dashboards, they, they get outdated very quickly and you need to continuously work on them. And uh, what we've seen is, is there's a lot of enthusiasm to get started, um, but there's actually a need to really continuously build out those partnerships at the local level to, uh, to, keep, them, to keep them going. And also often when you look at sort of what's possible first, you, you get very sort of taken away by what you can do with the data that's already there. But sometimes you find out that there's still gaps, right? So you need to be able to collect your own data. So that's sort of a thing that that is, um, yeah, a bit of a, uh, yeah, something that we need to evolve into and, and sort of build out our approach. So we're, we're kind of taking a shift from um, trying to sort of, yeah, just build those dashboards and, and basically then then hope that, you know, communities will, will do good work with it uh, towards building out those longer term partnerships and say, like, how can we support you in the long run? What else do you need in order to build out what we would call a, a full local data ecosystem, which would then include not just the data and the dashboard, but really the people working with the data and using it in their day to day work. The second challenge is uh, we haven't quite found the right approach of scaling yet. And, and that's almost in the word, right? Scaling always makes you think about bigger and larger, but actually we need to scale what's smaller, right? The challenge is in, in bringing this work to smaller communities. Right now we've got a sweet spot in, in what you could call mid-tier city. So a hundred thousand to a million inhabitants. But a lot of people and a lot of people of those who are, who are struggling living in, in much smaller communities in rural areas. And we, we're still working on finding the right approach to get there. And, and we're working now with our partners in, in Manitoba, with uh, the Winnipeg Foundation and United Way. Uh, we've got a brilliant project underway to, uh, to do that. But again, here it's as you're as you're trying to reach those that are most behind, your 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 effort is is increasing, right? So so we're we're really in that space where um, we need to we need to spend more time, more effort on on reaching those that we haven't reached uh, until now. So so that is sort of a challenge that's out there. Now, of course, you, you wouldn't have give a complete answer about challenges. You wouldn't talk about funding, right? But I, 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 you know, we all know that that's that's challenging all the time. But maybe a bit more nuanced uh, answer to that would be to say. We, we need to figure out how to to account for those two challenges in the way we're setting up our funding programs, right? To find sort of the longer term, more patient capital that invests into these data infrastructure um, projects. And also to get the understanding that as we're moving to smaller communities, you know, your, your quantitative performance metrics are no longer adequate, right? We're no longer trying to reach the most number of people with the, the least amount of money and effort, but we actually need to spend the, the money needed on the, and the the resources needed to reach those that we haven't reached yet because we haven't done so in the past and we're still failing them at this moment. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all that context. So my next question is, do you have a set of key priorities right now in your work you'd like to amplify to our listeners and our viewers? Yeah, so so I mean, as I said before, that one of the things that we learned is that, that the data that we're collecting right now and we're disaggregating to the local level isn't always the most appropriate data for decision makers at the local level, right? So so there is something, and it's not it's not just the data gap. It's not that we, we're not covering the issue, but it's where we might need to find what data that's collected in different ways that, that looks at the problem a little bit differently. And one of the solutions that's actually being becoming very much, uh, it's getting a lot of recognition internationally is, is the concept of citizen data. So really to have groups, have community groups, have citizens collect their own data because they know that they need it and also collect it in a way that they can track their, their progress easier, right? Uh, I mean, one, one problem is if you use census data that only comes out every five years. So for five years, you don't actually know whether you're making progress or not. But if you're collecting your own data, you can actually collect it every year or even every month if you want to, to really detect whether you're moving in the right direction or whether there's something happening that's pushing you back. And in COVID, we, we really learned that, 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 you know, things were happening on the ground. We needed to do something immediately. So we couldn't really wait until the next data set comes out to see whether this has been working or not. But um, so that's one of the concepts we're really trying to push. And we're working again with international partners also on advancing the, the overall idea. Um, and the, the other thing, as, as I said before, is like really to get into stable waters, right? To, to have that confidence that when we work in a certain place 
and at some point we're we're sort of maybe withdrawing or, or decreasing our support in in a place that things will be okay and they they won't uh, they won't they don't depend on on, on the, the the continuous support from the outside because they found a way to uh, to use it. So again, finding that right size like that that it's manageable, that it's useful, and that it actually leads to and it helps in generating some real impacts in the community. Incredible. So what is your ultimate goal and what does success look like and feel like to you and your colleagues? Yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, it's, you know, uh, improvements or measurable improvements in community well-being that are both sustainable and inclusive, right? So the the, the little edition for all that's always in the C, in the SDGs, that's that's really the one that we're taking uh, taking seriously there. And uh, um, what's what's exciting about our work is that we're not just working on the improvements, right? We're working on the measurability as well. So we're, we're actually taking responsibility for both of those terms, like measurable improvements. And uh, what's what's really what's really um, great to see is when the concept is being taken up by decision makers. So in Winnipeg, there's now the, the our Winnipeg plan, which is the, the long-term sustainable development plan for the city, makes reference to the SDGs and it makes reference to the indicators that we've developed um, because they see that they're working and they see that that they're appreciated by community organizations. So we're, we're getting that, that whole of community approach that everybody is, is, uh, is vying for. We're, we're starting to see how that is emerging. Um, so we're hoping we can do that much faster in uh, in other places. So that's that's the uh, the ultimate goal for 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 us to uh, um, yeah to, to really make an impact. Congrats. So my last question: Do you have any closing thoughts or calls to action for our listeners and our viewers? Yeah, I mean, probably most people have heard of the sort of the talk around that we're sort of now beyond the halfway mark on the SDGs, and there's sort of beginning discussions of what's coming next and so on and so on. And it's I mean, it might sound boring, but if you use a sports analogy, right? If you're in, you, you can pick whatever game whatever game uh, uh, you're interested in. Uh, you, you're at halftime and you're far behind, right? So uh, you're going to go out and play, right? If you if you want to if you want any, any chance of winning, you got to go out and play and focus on, on on winning. So that's the main thing. Let's let's talk about what's after 2030 when we're there. But the other thing is, even if we're not winning, I think everybody would agree that the second half is always more exciting than the first half. And if players would say, where did they grow? Where did they learn something about their their techniques and so on? They would probably always tell you it happens in the second half. So let's go out there and say, even, even if it looks like we're not going to reach it, we'll definitely learn what we need to do afterwards and then take stock of, of where we're at. Um, but it's it's really um, sort of keeping that enthusiasm going and, uh, and, and um, yeah. Um, just believing in it that we can still make progress. Incredible. Thank you so much, Stefan, for your authenticity, your leadership, and your consistent solidarity and all the remarkable work you're doing locally and internationally to advance SDGs. And once again, as always at Setsi, we give thanks to the original stewards of the various lands we're on. In terms of all conversations we have, we give thanks to all our ancestors, all those who toil without compassion or compensation. We give thanks to all our elders, community stalwarts, whose shoulders we stand on as we build, share, and learn together for our collective liberation and sovereignty. Thank you so much, Stephen. I so appreciate you. Thank you so much, Victor. Let me let me join the thanks uh, uh, to to our elders and our creators, but also a personal thanks to you for doing this and bringing this all together. Oh, Thank you so problem. much. Thank you so much.